Many thanks indeed for joining us for tonight's broadcast. I'm Ethan Tashobia and my guest anchor tonight, Mark Guamaka, who, will be, who I will be introducing to you later on. He has a lot to tell us, especially during this time as we commemorate the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Let's dive straight into the details. President Paul Kagame has urged fellow East African leaders to get down to do the work that is entailed in the statements they have made to their people if the regional bloc is to achieve deeper and wider integration. The head of state was attending a ceremony of the signing of the DRC's Treaty of Accession into the East African Community, a ceremony that took place in Nairobi, Kenya, and was hosted by President Uhuru Kenyatta, the current chairperson of the East African Community Heads of State. Sergeant Ori has more. Also present was President Yowari Kaguta Museveni of Uganda and President Felix Chisekedi of the DRC who signed the treaty. The current chairman of the EAC welcomed the vast nation into the community. To my brother and friend, President Chisekedi, and to the people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we welcome you to the East African Community Customs Union and the East African Community Common Market. These two are the signature pillars of our community and the foundation upon which the social, political, trade, investment, and economic interests stand. In the coming days, our ministers and technical experts will indeed move with speed to integrate the DRC into the organs of our community. In his address, President Paul Kagame urged EAC leaders to implement what the community decides on as one. Your Excellencies, we have uh, made very many speeches in our years in the recent past and beyond. I think uh, we just have to get down to do the work that uh, uh, is entailed in the statements we have made to our people of our individual countries, as well as the East African community. And uh, I am with you all the way to achieving the objectives of uh, the deeper and wider integration of our communities. On his part, the president of the DRC, His Excellency Felix Kisekedi, noted that his country joining the EAC is a dream come true and one that has been a long time coming. He gave assurances that the benefits of integration will reach all member states. During the ceremony, the new map of the EAC, that includes its seventh and latest member, was unveiled. The community's population has now grown by 90 million people, reaching 267 million in total. Yeah, and you are still watching news indeed. Political analysts are noting that Rwanda's judicial system has achieved remarkable milestones over the years, including conclusions of the massive uh, case load that was part of the Gachache court system. People who were sentenced by the court system, however, are asking that genocide perpetrators still at large are apprehended so that relatives of their victims can get justice. <sighs> This is a vocational training center at Gachiriro here in Kigali, and the students are being assisted by 53-year-old Leonidas Kupgimana, a former soldier who returned to Rwanda in 2018. I was part of what used to be far, and after we lost the war, I of course became a rebel, fighting for the FDLR FOCA. I would be a liar if I claim not to have been afraid when I returned back to Rwanda. That first night was particularly difficult for me. However, in the morning, people who had returned before us came to talk to us, former fighters themselves and people we knew, who all seemed perfectly fine, so that put us at ease. They told me about this center, and so I came here for vocational training. I completed my training in October, and by November I had been given a job. No two stories are the same, and for Vincent Hitiise, 
He was sentenced to 12 years in prison back in 2005 for crimes he committed during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi and served his time. He believes other genocide perpetrators still free abroad should also answer for their crimes. <laughs> They also played a role in the crimes that killed so many of our country's people and should be brought to justice wherever they may be so that the relatives of their victims can get justice. There are some we know to be criminals, hiding in Europe and other countries here in Africa, yet we know very well what they did. It is unfortunate when such people abroad meet with the relatives of the people they killed, yet those criminals never answered for their crimes. It must really hurt those who lost their loved ones. It has also been pointed out that what Rwanda has achieved judicially is nothing short of a miracle, and those who criticize the country's justice system have no basis to do so. Rwanda is on the right track. If anything, the country has exceeded the progress it was expected to make by this point in time. Looking at those points I told you about, you will find no other place on earth where such atrocities were committed or such solutions found afterwards. Honestly, those criticizing this country should stop and instead come here to learn from us on how to solve the world's problems. Those who criticize us did nothing to help us when we needed them the most, when the genocide was being prepared, implemented, and afterwards during the Kachacha court system era. Regardless, we were still able to do everything ourselves. During the ceremony on Thursday to commemorate the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi, President Paul Kagame also made this observation. We are a small country. But we are big on justice. And some of those are big and powerful countries, but they are very small on justice. They have no lessons to teach anyone because they are part of this history that is so over a million of our people perish, needed them to speak out, to speak up, to come to their help. Rwanda's leaders and people in general understand what some others elsewhere may be ignorant about or just pretend to be, that you cannot teach what you yourself fail to do, while at the same time criticizing those who achieved what you wouldn't have under similar circumstances. Thank you, sir, for that report. Now, this Friday, an accident injured over 30 people in Kamonyi district, according to figures from the National Police. Ac the accident happened in an area called Bush Bushasha in uh, Jihinga cell, close to Kamonyi district headquarters. According to eyewitnesses, a truck had a brake failure, hitting nine cars and injuring many people. So far, no death has been recorded. Joining us live on phone is the spokesperson of police, CP John Bosco Cabrera, to give us the latest. Thank you so much, Afande, for joining us. Hello, good evening. Uh, if you could tell us exactly what caused this accident and what is the latest that you have so far. Thank you very much. Yes, today, uh, around 11 a.m., an accident happened in that area of Kamuni uh, and was caused by a worry that was coming from Mohanga which overtook other vehicles in the curved road. So, uh, and it other eight vehicles. In total, nine vehicles were involved in an accident that resulted in the injuries of the two people. And um, 21 of them, by this time, by, by, the, by the evening, had been uh, uh, released from the hospital and... Uh, Eleven of them are still being uh, cared for. Uh, four in uh, Kigali and uh, seven in uh, Kamonyi. Uh, what is the gravity of the injuries of those who are still in the hospitals? Uh, how serious is it? 
No, they did not suffer, uh, they, they did not uh, sustain life threatening injuries. We, we hope they will soon be discharged from the hospitals. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, now we understand that it's not the first time that you know this area has uh, you know recorded fatal accidents in the past. What is being done to make sure that you know uh, we found a lasting solution? A, la a solution is found uh, to you know mitigate such accidents. The lasting solution could probably come from drivers, uh, reckless drivers who really don't observe and respect the road safety rules and laws. Because uh, in that particular area, there is a, a curved road, there are road signs, and actually they are supposed to be to try to overtake when they have a very clear sight of where they are going and what is in front of them. So for a vehicle coming from Hunger, uh, reaching a curved road, when a driver cannot be able to have a clear sight of at least 100 meters in front of him, you just try to overtake the cars and then it is likely that you are going to have an accident, clearly. And that is what happened today. So we need behavioral change. We've been trying to, 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 to educate the public and drivers specifically to respect truck rules and regulations. But uh, some of them appear not to be uh, heeding to the advice and the, and the campaign we've been conducting. So we hope to sustain the campaign uh, because uh, some of these accidents are actually available. Because if you had not tried to overtake other vehicles, I could not have hit the, 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 on cam the other vehicles that were going towards Muhanga uh, and eight of them, whereby those people sustained injuries. So they need to change their behaviors. So it's not true that actually the truck was, uh, you know, uh, in old shape or in bad shape, as some have been claiming. No, the, the truck, the truck never lost the control or never had brake failure. It just overtook other cars in the, in the curve, the part of the road, because the, the driver could not see, could not have a clear sight of, of what was in front of him. So uh, as a result, he hit other eight cars that were going towards Mohanga. CP John Bosco Cabrera, the spokesperson of police, man, thanks for your time indeed. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. bye. You're still watching our TV news. Now, genocide survivors have been commending the courage of the soldiers of what used to be Rwanda Patriotic Army for having stopped the genocide against the Tutsi and liberating the country. The statements were made as some of those survivors recounted the events of the April 8, 1994. The 8th of April, 1994, dawned in Rwanda on a country and people that were in the grip of the fastest genocide in recorded human history and Joseph Mukasa, now 58 years old, was living at Mumena in Nyamirambo sector here in Kigali, and like many others, had fled to College Saint Andre and its clergy thinking they would be safe after the widespread massacres had begun the day before, but it was not to be. They started shooting as they came into the compound in formation, having surrounded the entire school in the nuns' quarters, and they continued to march forward killing until all groups came face to face. I had decided beforehand where I would hide, which was in the building that housed the college's electrical grid control units in one of the transformer boxes, and just as I had told the priest I would, I headed for it. To get to my hiding spot, I had to climb two walls and jump through a tiny window, all while getting shot at. Initially, we were a group of 12 men, but I was the only one running crouched like an animal so as not to get shot, and all around me the others started to scream as the bullets cut them down. In other parts of the city, especially what are now the sectors of Nyamirambo and Rueza Menyo, members of former President Juvenal Habjarimana's Republican Guard were working with the Nerahamwe militia with the goal of wiping out the Tutsi that lived in those parts. And as the genocide raged on, the few RPF Ingotani soldiers that were in Kigali were faced with the seemingly impossible task of getting those who were being hunted to safety. I 
Na Musada mfite mfite Their commander told them to make for Sendi the parliament building and they responded over the walkie talkie that they had only one grenade launcher asking how they were supposed to get us all there He insisted however that the only chance any of us had was to get to Sendi So the two soldiers and the one civilian they had been staying with in Yamirambo when the genocide began told us to start walking towards the parliament in a single formation. Understand that we were 800 people, almost all of them women and children because most of us men had been killed. And yet two soldiers were able to lead us across the city to the safety of Sayendi. That was the most difficult journey I have ever had to make. Do not ask me how two soldiers could fight their way through the city like that. I must commend their courage, but I must also say that it was as if God himself was fighting alongside them because I still don't understand how they pulled it off, shooting their way right through Jikondo and evacuating 800 people when they were just two. Baffling as it may be for Joseph, the odds the RPF were facing all across the country were not all that different from what they saw those two soldiers managed to do. And yet they were driven by the realization that if they were going to save anyone, they had to hurry, as Afrodis Katera explains another genocide survivor. On the 7th, they arrived here at Chimihura and started killing and continued to do so right through the 8th. By the 9th, they had started looting. They announced that they had stopped killing but that we must all show ourselves and anyone found hiding in their houses would be killed. They informed us that they were letting us live until the day they buried Habjariman and that we would die on that day, which they said was to be the 5th of July. So we stayed there waiting to die. Then lo and behold, Kigali was captured on the 4th of July. And that is how we in other parts of the country, on the 8th of April, the atrocities were being committed and the bodies continued to pile up. In what used to be Tava commune of Jitarama, the Tutsi were killed. Jean-Napoleon Mubirigi of Kamembe commune led the massacre of the Tutsi that had fled to Nganga parish. Many more were killed at Wuhinga in Changugu, and countless other atrocities were committed elsewhere. Nduwayas Elia from Musanze district, who survived the genocide against the Tutsi, testified that his activities, including establishment of a school that provides employment to more than 250 people, is a donation to the country and the RPF in Otani, who gave her, him uh, life after they survived the genocide. We have this report. Elia is a 57-year-old man born in Musanze district. He says he was often persecuted as a young man for being a Tutsi, forcing him to flee the country. But when he returned in the 1990s, he was imprisoned in Rohingya prison among the enemies of the state who were accused of siding with the RPF in Otani rebels back in time. He was later set free in 1991 after RPF captured the area and released prisoners. <laughs> We had very heavy gunfire that night. We were supposed to be killed and we were wondering if there was a disagreement between those who were supposed to execute us. From that time, Nduwayas and his children were taken into the RPF camp until the liberation struggle had ended and the genocide against the Tutsi had been stopped. I saw a young man shoot at the door of our cell. He fired three times into the padlocks and, and opened our cell. He was about 20 years old. He ordered us to get out of the prison. He addressed himself as Ingotanyi and said that he had set us free. That's when I followed Ingotanyi. Upon return to his home area, he found that some of his family members had been killed. However, he was not discouraged. For him, it was time to take action, and that's how he joined the education sector. In 2008, Nduwayo's Elia, with minimal resources, founded Wisdom School. The school has since expanded its branches in Rubavu, Brera, and Nyabihu districts and has employed more than 250 people. I had to pay back. I owed a lot to the people who set me free from this prison. To get out of this prison, some people paid the ultimate sacrifice for me to survive and live. I had to pay back to the country. I chose education. Education is key to development. Education is a pillar for transformation. Education is everything.
Nduwayezu Elia points out that for Rwanda to sustain her gains and continue to prosper, the present and future generations must strive to build patriotic citizens dedicated to preserve the achievements of the country. Nduwayezu Elia is currently married with four children. Since 2012, Wisdom School has graduated more than 1,000 students, and the school has often won prizes in international competitions. Welcome back. You're still watching RTV News. In other news, stories making headlines globally, Russia has intensified its assault on eastern Ukraine, striking a train station packed with refugees trying to flee. At least 30 people were killed and more than 100 wounded in the attack. This comes as a new evidence of the atrocities by the Russian forces has emerged. The Russian Defense Ministry denies tra targeting the site. We have this report courtesy of NBC. You're still watching our TV news. This is the moment we get to receive our guest anchor. And this time round, it's Mark Gwemaka. You saw him doing great with the news presentation, Mark. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think you're in the wrong uh, career, whatever you're doing. So Mark is uh, the co-founder of Peace and Love Proclaimers. And these are the people who are actually behind the Walk to Remember. Mark himself is the founder of Walk to Remember that we've had for so many years. He works with Edges Trust a company that manages uh, Kigali Genocide Memorial. He's the coordinator for international engagements and outreach. And tonight, he tells us why it is very important for young people to remember the genocide against the Tutsi. Thanks indeed for joining us. You're welcome. So um, let's go straight to why is it important uh, for us to continue remembering what happened 28 years ago? Mm, I, I think uh, most of the times, people don't take history at heart and uh, they end up repeating it. So for us as a nation to go forward, uh, we mustn't um, forget where we came from, yeah. but heed the lessons we got from it so that from that we can forge the way forward. So it's important not only for the young people, but also for the grown-ups to make sure that we pass on these, um, what we learned from our history, to make sure that uh, it doesn't happen again. So we cannot say never again, and then forget to remember, because it's through remembrance that we make a testament that it won't happen again. I understand we didn't have the work to remember here in the country because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but we saw uh, the events organized across the world. This is a popular uh, event that has, we've seen, especially during the, this time we get to remember our loved ones who perished during the genocide. If you look at, you know, when you are, you know, coming up with the idea of work to remember and where it has come so far, uh, did you ever imagine it would, you know, go, um, you know, this wide and bigger? No, not really. But um, I don't think Walk to Remember would have become what it became without the government of Rwanda. Um, we were young people, teenagers, uh, thinking about changing the world. And um, we started where we could, which was uh, here in Rwanda, also starting with high school students. And, um, you know, the more students left Rwanda and went to other parts of the world, the more it became bigger. But also the more the government of Rwanda embraced it, then it actually made it bigger. So um, we never thought it would be a big thing, uh, myself and my colleagues. Uh, but the more we kept on working on it, the bigger it became. And um, the more it went even global. What does it signify? signify? The walk is a, a series of events that happen. Uh, what most people see is people walking, but uh, we have what we call the power of image, where we go to different places and teach about the genocide against the Tutsi. And one of the most important reasons um, for that is because we want people to walk when they're educated and they know why they are walking. And this was mainly for young people. Uh, by the time we started, not many young people were going for, for, for Kwibuka events. <coughs> But that being said, we, we, we managed to have enough young people come to these events. And um, the work itself, coming from uh, where people learn about the history of the genocide, and then they go 
to the part where now they themselves go to mobilize other people and then to the time that we walk which is a sig uh, signifies walking from a dark past into the brighter future but also when we get to the venue where we we get to read a hundred names now these a hundred names signify a hundred days of the genocide and each name signifies over 10,000 people who died on each day so that brings up to 1 million people uh, who are killed uh, during the genocide and then after that we light a candle yeah. which is a sig significance is showing that we are are embracing um, the future but also uh, which is bright uh, to to also the names are divided in yeah. three parts usually it's the younger generation uh, the middle-aged generation and the older generation. The older generation was the generation that carried on positive values that guided our community so we remember them because when they are killing them they are actually trying to take away the, the positive values that yeah. were guiding our community. The middle-aged people where the people are working for this country and when they are killing them they're actually trying to take away uh, the power of the nation at that point in time but also when they are killing the young people they are killing the future of Rwanda. So we light a candle uh, for those people. Mm. Yeah. Mark, um, let's talk about the young people especially what their role in this uh, time yeah. of remembrance. Uh, we often get to see the young people detached from, you know, uh, events, especially national events, may not be specifically this one, but, you know, um, oftentimes they drag their feet into this. Why is it so important for young people to take part? You know, genocide happened 28 years ago. Ah. We are recovering and we're going well, but young people still probably are not more involved in this. I think they use not to be involved. Uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow there is an event, Our Past, which uh, I would encourage many people to be a part of, which was started by a young man, a group of young people. Uh, we have, uh, you know, other groups, for example, 100 Children Survivors, uh, Dukundani, IRG, and many other groups, actually, who do very many activities. Maybe a few activities have gotten on the national level, but what is now happening is young people are owning Kwibuka, and they're becoming creative in making sure that they learn the history. Probably there might be few who, who are not there, but just like any healthy community, there'll be people who will be slow. Um, and I think with the time, and with time, they're also going to bring them. So I don't see young people laying back. Maybe what we need to do now is how do we equip them with more knowledge? Um, and that is not only a call for the young who know what to do, but it's also a call for anyone who, who knows more about history to make sure that these young people know exactly what they are going to do. And for those who are not um, doing it, I might say you're lagging behind for no reason because this is our history, you know. So why wouldn't you want to be involved, you see? But I know for sure that it is improving as the years go by. Do you have any message for the young people in addition to what he just said? Sure. Uh, for the young people, what I would say to you is that uh, there are things that we need to work on. One, we need to be critical thinkers. We've heard before people saying that uh, they were told to do and they did. But for you, I'd urge you to be a critical thinker so that you make your own choices. But you also have to have empathy. If they did the same to you, how would you feel? So have empathy towards the other. And then lastly, you should be responsible. Be responsible for your actions, be responsible for what you do, be responsible for your life now so that you can also prepare the better future. So be responsible by joining Kwibuka. Mark Gomaka, PRP co-founder, founder of Work to Remember, the coordinator for international engagements and outreach at Edges Trust. And thanks for your time. Indeed. Thank you for hosting me. And that brings us to the end of tonight's edition uh, with me and my guest anchor, Mark Gomeka, until on the rest of the entire news production team. Many thanks for your company tonight. Remember, unite, renew.